September 1939, the Blitzkrieg rips through Northern Europe. On the ground, Hitler's tanks roll over entire armies. In the air, the Luftwaffe is deemed unstoppable. The Imi-109 and Stuka dive bombers fly virtually unopposed, raining terror on both military and civilian targets. The Allies would have to destroy the Luftwaffe to win the war. This is the story of how that was achieved. The strategies, the planes, and the men who flew them. I'm Stuart Culpepper, and welcome to this special edition of Wings. You're about to get a glimpse of the future while on a journey to the past. The subject, the air war over Europe in World War II. On the brink of war in 1939, few could have known that the airplane, a relatively new technology, would play such a decisive role in world history. You'll be witnessing that history in a new way, this program utilizes CD-ROM technology that allows us access to graphics and airplane statistics that shaped the war. In fact, I'm standing in one of those graphics, a 3D briefing room much like those where World War II flyers got their mission orders. I'll be joining you here from time to time as the story unfolds, a story that begins as Nazi Germany prepares for war. The year is 1935. Hitler officially unveils his secret air force, the Luftwaffe. 11,000 men and 1,800 planes. It is a startling act of defiance. A key provision of the Treaty of Versailles prohibits Germany from building a military air force. But world reaction is strangely subdued. Germany had been developing bombers like the Ju-86 and the HE-111 masquerading as commercial aircraft, though military potential was never far from the minds of their designers. Now the pretense is dropped. The Germans don't bother to conceal their plans to fly the Messerschmitt 109 as a fighter plane. They enter it in races. In 1937, it will break the world speed record at 379 miles per hour and send shock waves across Europe. Hitler knows that supremacy in the air will be crucial to his plans. He orders a wide array of new aircraft, mainly fighters and medium bombers to support ground units. Counting on short battles and decisive victories, Hitler decides against the development of a long-range strategic bomber, a decision that will return to haunt him. By 1936, Germany has the men and the planes, but it needs a proving ground to test them, a war it can borrow long enough to perfect new tactics and technologies. Unfolding events in Spain provide that opportunity, the Spanish Civil War. The Luftwaffe forms a special unit, the Legion Condor to help the fascist General Francisco Franco and the right-wing nationalists overthrow the Spanish government. By November of 36, Germany has delivered 40 planes and 4,500 men to the Spanish rebels. One German general remarks that two years' war experience in Spain have proved more useful than 10 years' peacetime training. For one thing, the battle against the loyalists gives the Nazis a chance to test the role of air power in a new form, Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. Like a gathering storm, thunderbolts of aircraft are sent ahead of Franco's ground units to surprise loyalist fighters. It proves devastatingly effective and leads to an unexpected discovery. Massive bombing of cities like Madrid and Guernica causes panicked civilians to jam the roads and highways of escape. The result? Military traffic is brought to a near standstill. 
the bombing of civilian targets becomes standard practice from then on. But maybe the most important aspect of Germany's borrowed war is the dress rehearsal it provides for Luftwaffe pilots, many of whom are seeing action for the first time. The most successful ace to earn his wings in Franco's war is Werner Mulders. A brilliant fighter pilot, Mulders earns 14 kills in the skies over Spain. He is also a perceptive tactician. Mulders develops a new combat formation that proves much more effective than the old three-plane system. In Mulders' finger four formation, several groups of fighters fly side by side each group consisting of two planes, a leader in front and a wingman behind, covering the leader's back. Mulders is spurred to devise this formation by the speed and maneuverability of a new Russian fighter. Like Germany, the Soviet Union is using the Spanish Civil War as a testing ground for men and machines. The plane, the Polykarpov I-16, is flown by Russian pilots alongside the Spanish loyalists. A stubby little monoplane nicknamed the Rat, the I-16 is a fair match against the early Messerschmitt 109s it encounters. But soon, the Germans send in more advanced aircraft, and the Soviet-backed loyalists surrender to Franco. The war is over. The Russians' hard losses spur them to start crash programs developing new war machines equal to the German invasion they fear is coming. But both the Soviets and the Germans know they are not yet ready for a fight. And as an astonished world looks on, the sworn enemies sign a mutual non-aggression pact, a pact neither Hitler nor Stalin have any intention of respecting. The treaty is advantageous to both sides, the Russians use the time to retool their factories to build modern tanks and warplanes. And the Germans now have a free hand to open up the Western Front, beginning with the invasion of Poland. Russia and Germany agree to split it right down the middle. And World War II is only days away. Privately, Luftwaffe Commander-in-Chief Hermann Goering isn't sure German forces are ready for war. But publicly, Goering is confident. Leave it to my Luftwaffe, he brags. Events justify his boast. September 1st, 1939. More than 2,000 of Goering's planes line up across the border from only 463 Polish frontline aircraft. As dawn approaches, a trio of Junkers 87 Stukas bombed two railway bridges spanning the Vistula River, launching their attack 15 minutes before Germany's official declaration of war. World War II begins in the cockpit of a Stuka dive bomber. Nazi propaganda later claims that the Luftwaffe has destroyed the Polish Air Force almost entirely on the ground. The truth is, Polish pilots put up a valiant but futile fight against overwhelming odds. The Polish P-11 fighters could not compete with the faster Messerschmitt 109. Two days later, Britain and France joined the war against Germany. But the cause is hopeless. The Polish Air Force is already collapsing, done in almost as much by the incompetence of its own officers as by the power of Blitzkrieg. Anti-aircraft commanders fail to familiarize gun crews with the profiles of Polish planes. One in three air crews is lost to friendly fire. On the ground, Polish strategists are still committed to the use of cavalry in modern warfare. The men and horses are especially vulnerable to the Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. Screaming out of the skies in a near vertical dive, a Stuka can hit its target within an amazingly small 30-yard radius.
Stukas are deployed against Polish military and civilian targets alike with such effectiveness that even the Nazis are surprised by its success. The Stuka is the airborne embodiment of Blitzkrieg, a virtual swastika in the sky. Flyers soon discover that the plane's sinister profile terrifies soldiers and civilians. By the end of September, Warsaw is in ruins. Stukas and other German aircraft fly free and unopposed across Polish skies. The Nazi juggernaut is loose. The Luftwaffe has little trouble sweeping across most of Northern Europe. The tactics of these early successes are quite simple. First, they use the element of surprise to pound much of the enemy's air force while it's still on the ground. Whatever air power remains is overwhelmed by the Luftwaffe's superior technology and sheer numbers. Finally, with enemy air forces out of the way, German dive and level bombers are free to hit major cities and transportation targets. Panicked civilians flee, congesting road and rail lines. Now immobilized, the military transport and civil defense structures of these countries simply collapse. The Nazi Blitzkrieg sweeps across France, rising to a thunderous peak as the Wehrmacht nears the English Channel. The British Expeditionary Force has no choice but to evacuate to the French Channel port of Dunkirk. German bombers bear down on the beaches, and a few British and French soldiers are captured. Meanwhile, hundreds of ships, military and merchant, converge on the English Channel to boat lift the Allied troops to Britain. Hermann Goering brags to Hitler that his Luftwaffe can smash the retreating British and French armies without the assistance of ground troops. Here, Hitler makes his first costly mistake of the war. Trusting Goering's boast, he holds back his panzers and allows the Luftwaffe to handle Dunkirk. But air power alone won't do the job. 380,000 British and French troops gain the time needed to evacuate to Britain and the chance to fight again another day. Now, defended only by the tattered remnants of the French army, France falls within three weeks, leaving Britain alone to face the relentless Nazi war machine. But while the Nazis are busy installing a puppet French government at Vichy and rearming themselves, the British have a chance to brace for an invasion which the Germans have codenamed Operation Sea Lion. Knowing an invasion is imminent and ignoring the hopeless odds against winning, the British make the best of Germany's six-week lull. Production of England's two principal fighter planes reaches a fever pitch as assembly lines crank out Hawker Hurricanes and Supermarine Spitfires. Both planes rely on the Rolls-Royce Merlin V-12 inline engine, a design legend that will be used in many different aircraft throughout the war. The Spitfire's success covering the retreat at Dunkirk proved that it's a good match for the Luftwaffe's Messerschmitt 109. It's almost as fast and a touch more maneuverable than the 109. The Hurricane, on the other hand, is a slower, heavier aircraft that is extremely vulnerable to German fighters. But this weakness is also a strength. The Hurricane provides a very stable platform for its 830 caliber machine guns. Some pilots prefer it to the Spitfire. The British decide to team up their fighters. The Hurricanes will fly against German bombers and the Spitfires will cover the Hurricanes. July 1940. Goering once again assures Hitler that his now refreshed Luftwaffe can break the Royal Air Force unaided and paved the way for Operation Sea Lion. Seemingly invincible, the German Air Force now faces a challenge that will test its technical superiority. The Battle of Britain begins.
Facing modern opposition for the first time, the Stuka dive bomber suffers catastrophic losses in the opening rounds, 20% overall, and is withdrawn from the battle. Performing almost as poorly are the Junkers 88, the Heinkel 111, and the Dornier 17. Germany continues to manufacture these twin-engine level bombers almost exclusively, partly because they are faster to develop and cheaper to produce than an effective four-engine heavy bomber. But with only two engines, these bombers have neither the range nor the speed to outrun Allied fighters, nor do they have the power to carry adequate defensive fire. The Ju-88 has only six machine guns, the HE-111 only three, the Dornier 17 is about 100 miles an hour slower than a Spitfire. So all three bombers must rely heavily on fighter cover to avoid being pasted by the RAF. The ME-110 was originally designed to be the heavy fighter companion for a heavy bomber fleet that was never built. As such, it's slower and less maneuverable than British fighters and after suffering heavy losses, it too is withdrawn from the skies over England. The Messerschmitt 109 is a fair match against the best Britain has to offer, as long as it can stay in the air. But based at airfields in France, 109s can spend no more than about 20 minutes in British airspace before depleted fuel tanks force them to flee back across the channel. Many don't make it. For the first time, the Luftwaffe is facing a capable enemy defending its own turf. Perilous as the situation may be, the Germans have one important advantage, numbers. Germany's huge numerical superiority, both in men and machines, allows them to wear down the RAF in a war of attrition. Over a hundred British pilots are lost in the first two weeks of August alone. The Germans concentrate on plane factories and airfields like Hendon and Biggin Hill. And by the end of the month, RAF planes are being destroyed faster than they can be replaced. The Royal Fighter Command is on the verge of collapse. Now comes an act of fate that changes the course of the battle entirely. On the night of August 24th, off-course German bombers accidentally drop their payload on a civilian target, London. Britain swiftly retaliates by bombing Berlin, breaking Goering's promise that the German capital could never be hit. An outraged Hitler vows to erase British cities from the map, starting with London. Now, civilians bear the brunt of the battle as the Luftwaffe begins massive day and night bombing raids over London. Londoners are on constant alert for the wail of the air raid siren, driving them to the safety of the subway bomb shelters. They emerge the next morning to find smoking rubble where their homes once stood and hundreds of their neighbors dead. But ironically, Civilian bombing only strengthens Britain's hand. The RAF now gets the break it needs. With the pressure off military targets, Britain refreshes its pilots, rebuilds its factories, and repaves its airfields. With its newly improved Spitfire Mark II, the Royal Air Force returns from the brink of destruction and pounds the Luftwaffe without mercy. On September 15th, Britain downs 56 German planes, one-fourth of that day's invading force. Two days later, Hitler admits defeat. The Luftwaffe switches to a lighter bombing schedule, and Operation Sea Lion is postponed indefinitely. The Battle of Britain demonstrated for the first time that the Luftwaffe could be beaten. The technological superiority it had enjoyed over much of Northern Europe was now a thing of the past. But Hitler remained confident that England would fall, eventually. So he turns his attention eastward. Although he and Stalin have signed a non-aggression pact 
neither leader expects it to last. Hitler knows that Russia's natural resources are the key to German prosperity. And Stalin knows that an invasion is imminent. But he doesn't expect trouble to start for months, perhaps even a year. The Russians are caught completely off guard when Hitler launches Operation Barbarossa on June 22nd, 1941. Once again, Nazi commanders follow the doctrines of Blitzkrieg. German bombers race out ahead of the main ground forces, aiming for immediate command of the air. Stunned Soviet pilots watch helplessly as their I-15s and I-16s are blown up sitting on their airfields. The Russians do enjoy a huge numerical advantage. 9,000 aircraft on their western border against only 1,400 combat-ready German planes but four-fifths of the Red Air Force is obsolete. And with the advantage of surprise, the Germans managed to take out 3,000 Russian planes in only 10 days. Operation Barbarossa now moves into its ground phase. Panzers blast away at Russian tanks with the Luftwaffe providing tactical support. But unfortunately for the German fighting men, Barbarossa is late in starting. In April, Hitler had diverted planes and panzers to help the Italian invasion of Yugoslavia and Greece. By the time Germany attacks Russia in June, Soviet generals are able to stall the Nazis long enough to enlist their great historical ally, winter. The first snow falls in early October, turning roads to mud. Soon the freezing Russian winter brings Luftwaffe operations almost to a standstill. At 50 below, most German war machinery is inoperable. The Soviets, on the other hand, are trained and equipped for the bitter cold and begin a counteroffensive in the dead of winter. They also seize the opportunity to mount one of the greatest feats of logistics in military history. The Soviets crate and ship almost their entire defense industry more than a thousand miles east beyond the Ural Mountains and out of German bomber range. In five months, 1,360 munitions plants alone have been moved eastward in 1.5 million freight car loads. Aircraft factories are thrown up in days, churning out planes before the roof is even up, in temperatures down to 40 below. Now the German planners realize the error of their ways. The shortage of four-engine heavy bombers was a hindrance for the Germans in the Battle of Britain. On the Eastern Front, it is a disaster. The Luftwaffe is unable to hit the distant Soviet factories, and dwindling German reserves face a freshly supplied Red Army. By December of 41, the Germans are down to 500 planes on the central Russian front, while the Soviet Air Force has massed more than twice that number around Moscow alone. To make matters worse, German logistical resources are stretched to the limit along the 2,100-mile Eastern Front. Then, on the other side of the globe, a fatal card is played. December 7th, hundreds of Japanese bombers and Zero fighters attack and sink more than half the American battleship fleet at anchor in Pearl Harbor. The U.S. joins the war on Japan and Germany, permanently shifting the balance of power in World War II. America's entry into the war brings massive aid to U.S. allies. President Roosevelt steps up delivery of weapons begun in March under the Lend-Lease Act. Aid to Russia, delivered through Alaska and the Middle East, includes thousands of Bell P-39 Era Cobras. The Era Cobra sports an unusual design. Its engine is mounted behind the pilot. The U.S. Air Force regards its underpowered engine and heavy armor as unsuitable for its designated role as an interceptor. But the Russians love its thick armor plating and easily aimed nose-mounted cannon. They immediately put it to use as a tank buster. Of the 9,000 Aracobras built in the U.S., more than half 
are delivered to the Soviet Union. The Red Air Force supplements the P-39 with its own anti-tank plane, the new Ilyushin II Stormovik. The entire forward fuselage of the Stormovik is an armored shell, and the plane is known for good reason as the flying tank. The IL-2 will end up with two cannons, three machine guns, and air-to-ground rockets. More Stormoviks are produced than any other plane of the war. The Luftwaffe also needs a tank buster on the Eastern Front, and it hopes to put the new ME-210 on the job. Complete redesign of the Messerschmitt 110, the 210 suffers from severe aerodynamic problems, leading to an epidemic of crashes. With the failure of the 210 project, the Germans have no choice but to adapt the dependable old Stuka for the job of tank buster. The Stuka is a relatively slow and easy target for the rebuilt Russian Air Force. Still, it's one of the linchpins of Germany's last, best hope to turn the tide of war, the battle for Kursk. The Soviet recapture of Kursk created a bulge on their central front that was practically an open invitation for a German pincer counterattack. On July 5th, 1943, the Nazis launch Operation Citadel. It will be the biggest tank battle of the war. The Germans open with a Blitzkrieg-style attack using 1,800 aircraft. Famed Stuka ace Hans Ulrich Rudel takes out an entire company of 12 Soviet tanks single-handedly. But the Germans are unaware that Soviet officers have received advance intelligence on their attack. Two million men, 6,000 tanks, and nearly two-thirds of the Red Air Force are dug in at Kursk prepared for the German attack. Finally, against Hitler's orders, General Fritz von Manstein orders a retreat, and the last German push on the Eastern Front collapses only a week after it begins. Hitler's failure on the Eastern Front marked a turning point in the war. Germany's lack of a long-range bomber proved disastrous when Russia moved its manufacturing plants over the Ural Mountains and out of German bomber range. German troops, stretched across thousands of miles, simply could not break Soviet lines in the brutal cold of a Russian winter. By now, America's entry into the war starts having a major effect. Each day, more men and machinery pour into England from across the Atlantic. And perhaps the single greatest addition to the Allied arsenal is the introduction of the B-17 bomber. Boeing aircraft's design for the B-17 is eight years old by 1943, but it's still the mainstay of the U.S. bomber force in Europe, a role it will hold to the end of the war. The B-17's four engines give it enough power to lift a massive bomb load, 8,000 pounds, over a considerable distance, more than 1,100 miles. The Wright Cyclone engines also provide enough lift for 10 50 caliber machine guns and a crew employed solely to operate them. The B-17 lives up to its nickname, the Flying Fortress. By the summer of 43, the British Isle is pocked with scores of airfields built to support the growing armada of 8th Air Force bombers sent from the States. Prime Minister Winston Churchill describes Britain as an island aircraft carrier. British and American Air Forces have officially divided up their workload. The Royal Air Force continues its safer but less precise nighttime bombing raids, while the U.S. Air Force pinpoints industrial and military targets during the day. 
American pilots quickly discover that the Germans are well prepared for these daylight runs. Long accustomed to the sight of a Messerschmitt 109, these airmen now face a new, more menacing profile, the Focke Wolf 190. Fitted with a 1700 horsepower BMW engine, the 190 is blazingly fast. And even at speeds over 400 miles an hour, it remains highly maneuverable. Fighters like the 109 and 190 make it tough for American bombers. A daytime raid on the Romanian oil refinery at Ploiesti ends in disaster when one third of the planes and 310 crewmen are lost. Things get worse in August when 376 B-17 bombers head for the ball bearing plant at Schweinfurt and Messerschmitt factory in Regensburg. Their P-47 fighter escorts have limited range and have to peel off early. As soon as they do, German fighters descend on the bombers, beginning the fiercest air battle in Western Europe thus far. In the end, 60 flying fortresses are shot down and a hundred more badly damaged. One in five crewmen dies. frantic search begins for methods to better protect these long-range bombers. One approach equips some of the bombers in each formation as defense fighters with additional guns and huge quantities of ammunition. The theory is that unsuspecting German fighters will treat these wolves in sheep's clothing as ordinary B-17s only to find a much pricklier opponent. Two more effective solutions are proposed and immediately put in practice. The first is the use of a new bomber formation, the closed box in which roughly 18 planes fly in close set squares to cover each other's flanks. Another innovation is the Chen mounted gun turret. The new B-17G has twin 50 caliber machine guns installed under the nose that the plane's bombardier operates by remote control. Now better equipped and better defended, U.S. bombers set out on October 14th to take a second crack at Schweinfurt. Once again, German fighters swoop down on the B-17s as soon as their fighter escorts abandon them. A desperate battle rages for miles across the German skies. In the end, only a third of the U.S. force returns to Britain unscathed. Pilots remember the day as Black Thursday. American commanders indefinitely suspend day raids over Germany until a new long-range fighter escort can be delivered. Until then, the Luftwaffe retains superiority in the air. By the fall of 1943, preparations are well underway for the Allied invasion of France, codenamed Operation Overlord. The buildup of troops and equipment in southeast England is massive, but Allied precautions keep it top secret. Meanwhile, Allied bombing over Germany resumes with much greater success as long-range fighter escorts begin to reach the 8th Air Force in greater numbers. P-47 Thunderbolts have now been fitted with 200-gallon pressurized drop tanks that double their range to 1,100 miles. As D-Day nears, the Thunderbolt is reconfigured again. Hundreds are armed with bombs or rockets for use as ground attack planes. Months before the planned June invasion, bombers take off round the clock to hit railway centers in northern France. Germany must be prevented from bringing up reinforcements once the Allied troops hit the beaches. The Allied plans involve a complex series of deceptions, including a phantom army, fake radio traffic, and dummy installations, all intended to convince Hitler that the invasion will come at Pas de Calais, 
north of the actual invasion site at Normandy. June 6, 1944. D-Day begins in the early hours after midnight when airborne troops are dropped behind enemy lines to secure bridges and protect the morning invasion force. Now making its way across the English Channel is the greatest armada of warships ever assembled, accompanied by the drone of over 10,000 aircraft. RAF and American bombers pound German pillboxes incessantly as Allied landing craft empty troops onto the beaches. German commanders plead for reinforcements. Hitler refuses, stubbornly insisting the real invasion will come to the north at Padi Calais. Within a week, Allied troops secure the beachhead. But the breakout from the French farm country toward Paris is longer in coming. A month after D-Day, more than a million men are still bottled up near the beaches. The German lines must be broken, and the US 9th Air Force is sent in to do the job. The 9th relies heavily for ground support on a mainstay fighter, the P-38 Lightning. Built by Lockheed, the Lightning has an odd twin boom design. The Germans call it the fork-tailed devil. Early models lack maneuverability, but rugged twin Allison engines give the Lightning exceptionally long range. In late July, the P-38 helps heavy bombers of the 9th Air Force pave the way for an Allied breakout with massive carpet bombing of German positions at San Lo. Confusion about targets causes heavy casualties on both sides. But US ground troops are still able to break through the German lines, then wheel around and crush the encircled Nazi units. The race across France is on. At this crucial moment, an attempt on Hitler's life gives the Allies an important advantage. Though he escapes serious injury, Hitler becomes increasingly irrational. He begins firing and replacing his generals in France almost weekly. Allied forces make the most of the confused German leadership and advance across France nearly 50 miles a day. Now, with airfields finally on the continent, Bombers have guaranteed fighter escort into Germany's industrial heartland. On Friday, August 25th, the Allied armies liberate Paris. The tide of war has turned. By September 1944, the battle for France is nearly won. But the battle of Germany is only beginning. the liberation of France, the Allies now gain a foothold on the continent. Waves of B-17s pound Germany's industrial heartland around the clock. But German industry manages to decentralize aircraft production so successfully that fighter output actually increases in the final year of the war. Fortunately for the Allies, these fighters are growing obsolete. However, in the scramble to find a new generation fighter, the Nazis make a frightening and remarkable advance. A plane no one can catch. The ME-262 is the world's first fully operational jet fighter aircraft. It flies well over 100 miles an hour faster than anything the Allies can field. A sitting duck during takeoffs and landings, it is virtually unstoppable once it's in the air. At 540 miles an hour, it can't be caught in a straight chase. 
But luckily for the Allies, when the 262 is first shown to Hitler in late 43, he decides it should be developed as a blitz bomber. Carrying a 2,200-pound bomb load, the 262 is no faster than a conventional bomber. Finally, in October, General of Fighters Adolf Gallen is able to persuade Hitler that the 262, now called the Swallow, should be used as a fighter. If that decision had come earlier, it might have affected the course of the air war. But with fuel stocks dwindling, the ME-262 is far too little and far too late. December 16th. The Germans throw everything they've got at the thin American lines near Belgium's Ardennes forest. U.S. troops fall back, and the spreading battlefront gives the offensive its nickname, the Battle of the Bulge. The next evening, the Luftwaffe launches its first nighttime paratroop drop near Liège to secure a key road against an American counterattack from the south. But within a week, the Allies send in 200,000 reinforcements, and Allied aircraft have complete control of the skies. Faced with certain defeat, Hitler orders a retreat. The last stand of the Third Reich is smashed. German resistance on the ground begins to flag as Allied warplanes inflict punishing blows on Berlin, Chemnitz, and Leipzig. Spearheading these raids on the German heartland is arguably the best Allied fighter plane of the war. North American's P-51 Mustang. The Mustang's 950-mile range finally gives the Allies a fighter capable of escorting heavy bombers to virtually any target, including Berlin. Designers first equipped the P-51 with an Allison engine. Later, to improve speed and high-altitude performance, they substitute a Rolls-Royce Merlin power plant, making the Mustang easily a match for the German 109 or 190. The Mustang is also cheap and easy to produce, less than half the price of a lightning or thunderbolt. By the end of the war, more than 15,000 will roll off assembly lines. On February 13th, P-51s guide U.S. and RAF bombers, starting a three-day raid on the picturesque town of Dresden. 3,900 metric tons of bombs create a firestorm that vaporizes 12 square miles of the city. Estimates of the death toll range from 60,000 to 250,000. Bomber crews describe the city as a huge, smoking heap of debris. On March 22nd, Patton's Third Army crosses the Rhine into the German industrial heartland. April 16th, Allied Air Chief Karl Spatz declares the strategic air war finished as the Soviets begin their assault on Berlin. April 21st, Hitler orders all Luftwaffe leaders to be hanged at once. The order is ignored. On April 30th, Hitler marries his mistress, Eva Braun, then shoots himself in his Berlin bunker. One week later, all armed forces of the Thousand-Year Reich surrender unconditionally. How did the mighty Luftwaffe, once deemed unstoppable, fall apart so completely? Most obvious were the many mistakes made by Germany's leadership, based on impulse rather than planning. The failure to develop a four-engine heavy bomber not only hampered the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain, it probably cost them the entire Russian front. Brilliant technology like the ME-262 fighter might have won the war for Germany, but it came too late. Unlike the Luftwaffe, the Allies made great use of long-range heavy bombers. Allied commanders realized that Bombing had to be organized on a massive scale to be effective. Although Germany's attempts at terror bombing frightened civilians, it was not nearly as effective as the carpet bombing of places like 
Hamburg, and Dresden. In the end, the commanders of the Third Reich grossly underestimated the industrial resources required to wage a world war. Efficient as it was, German industry had no hope of matching the seemingly bottomless capacity of the Allies. World War II began before the biplane had been retired from many of the world's air forces. By the time it was through, jets at 540 miles per hour were slicing through the skies, and the dawn of a new era in military aviation had begun. <laughs>